Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. You may have wondered what plane should I start with. I'm going to give you my suggestion on what should be the first hand plane you start your hand tool woodworking journey with. Stay with me. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. If you're new to hand tools or just getting into the hand plane side of hand tool woodworking, trying to figure out which plane could leave you with a headache, there are 11 what we call bench planes from the number one right through to the number eight. Uh, there's some ones that aren't very common, for instance, the number one and the number two. However, the three and four are quite common, four and a half, the five, probably the most common, five and a quarter, very rare, five and a half, six, seven, and an eight. And then if you include all the specialty planes, there's that many more. Well, there has to be some way to figure out what is best. There's all kinds of YouTubes out there. Everybody that uses one has an opinion. Remembering that most people, their only experience with hand planes was what they may have had in a school shop. So that doesn't always apply once you're an adult. I'm going to go through and I'm going to share with you what I think should be your first plane. And I'm going to give you a pretty good case as to why. And a special shout out to David Charlesworth, who influenced my decision about 20 years ago. Changed my whole look on what that first hand plane should be. And that's in memory to David Charlesworth, who passed recently. But he was an expert when it came to hand tools, especially hand Just plates. before I introduce my favorite, I want to break these into categories. So if you take the number eight and the number seven, these are classed as jointers. They have a long sole. They do an exceptional job at flattening or straightening because the long sole references off of the high points. This is a four plane. Leave that alone for a second. This is a jack plane. This one and this one, five, five and a quarter, five and a half. And these five are your smoothers. Short sole designed for finishing work, not very good at flattening, in fact, very difficult. And then in here in the middle, you have planes that are small enough to be an effective jointer, not quite long enough to be an effective jointer, but they do the job of both fairly well. Number six was a four plane, and it really doesn't have much of a function today. You could actually almost push it over there and say, you know what, it's close enough to being a joiner. You could use it for that function. So my recommendation, and as I mentioned, thanks to David Charlesworth, is the five and a half. Before that, I used the four and a half. However, in uh, exposure to David's methods, it really changed my mind. And I'm going to elaborate on this, but before I do, I want to challenge or at least explain what some other folks will tell you. And I'm going to give you my take on why you get that advice and why it may not be as accurate as some take it to be. So you were to ask 10 people, I would say eight of them would say, buy a number four as your first plane. And the other would two would say, buy a number five. Now, why are these planes popular? Well, most people, if they have any experience with hand planes at all, it would have been back in grade school woodshop. And grade school woodshop, these are the two planes that they outfitted the shops with, fours and fives. Now, the people that are using these planes are 13, 14-year-olds. And, of course, they're going to size the plane to the individual using it. Well, you're, there's a big difference between a 13-year-old and a 53-year-old. Your hand's going to have grown a substantial amount. If you take the number four, I call that the, the adolescent smoother. Compare that to the five for the four and a half. This is what I would consider to be the adult smoother. Same length, which means they're going to function the same. Two inch blade versus two and three eighths. This is cramped for an adult hand. This gives you more room, far more comfortable. A little bit heavier, does more work because the blade is wider. This is the adult jack plane. This is, pardon me, this is the adolescent jack plane, this is the adult jack plane. Now this is an older version. The newer jack planes, and I'm going to use this as an example, have a 2 and 3 eighths inch wide blade. About the same length, meaning again they're going to do the same function, however instead of 2 inch you're talking about 2 and 3 eighths. A little more room on that rear handle or tote, 
wider footprint, more stable in use, more heavy. Trust, believe me, a heavier plane is easier to use. Help, that inertia helps carry it through the wood. So this is the one that I would suggest be your first plane. Exception, if you're under 150 pounds, you might want to consider a number five. But if you're over, definitely a five and a half is going to be the plane that you'll use 85% of the time. I have all of these planes, and this is the one that you'll see in my hand most often. All right, let's get a little deeper into why the five and a half. All right, so if we're going to do go with a five and a half, the next question is which five and a half? And by that I mean, do you go with an old Stanley or record, or are you to buy a new one? And the new ones, there's several five and a halfs available. This happens to be a Wood River made by uh, Woodcraft. What's the difference? Well, there's a lot, and you need to consider it. The old planes were made out of, the bodies were made out of gray iron or cast iron. Now, the downside to that is if that drops on concrete, there's a good chance it's going to break. In fact, in collecting planes, you can see a lot of them have been dropped and broken. Now, you're not going to find that on the newer planes because they're made out of something called ductile iron, which has the same strength as tensile steel. Drop it, it's not going to break. Not only that, but they're stabilized before they're ground, so they're going to stay flat. And that's a big deal. Um, why else old versus new? Well, if you look at the blade on the old planes, they were relatively thin. In fact, they topped out at about 90, maybe as much as 95 thousandths of an inch, whereas the newer planes are anywhere from 125 thousandths to 140 thousandths of an inch. That makes a big difference in the stability of the blade and in eliminating what we would call chatter. Next thing you're going to look at, these older planes, I don't think they were ever built to do the kind of job that the new planes were. Let me explain. When Tom Lee Nelson introduced new modern hand planes by taking old designs and simply making them better, better materials, tighter tolerances, we went from shaping wood and then sanding with the old planes to not only shaping wood with the new plane, but being able to finish it and literally eliminating sandpaper. The surface you can get off of a plane like this you can't, there's no sandpaper that can even compare to it, not to mention the absence of dust. So that's another big reason. Um, the, I think the steel in the blades is going to be better than the old ones. And when it actually comes to sharpening and preparing it, you'll find that the old blades were so thin, they would literally flex under the weight of your fingertips, making it very different, difficult to prepare, particularly in comparison to the thicker blades. I also like the chip breaker. If you look at the old style chip breakers, this is what you're going to find on most Stanleys. They have that hump in there and you want that to lay nice and flat against the blade. It was a lot more difficult to prepare this than the new ones, which are thicker and they simply have a lip on the bottom side and it takes mere minutes to get that properly suited to the blade. A heck of a lot easier. Now, here's the other problem. If you're just getting into this and you really have never learned to sharpen a plane, you've never used a plane, how are you supposed to go in and tune and restore this when you don't really know what it's supposed to do when it is tuned or restored? Literally putting the cart before the horse. I think, and it's my suggestion, and I'll tell you right now, I sell these planes in Canada and other parts of the world, so there's some bias coming along with it. But whether you're talking about a Lee Nelson, a, um, a Clifton over in England, or a Wood River, these planes come ready to be used. Learn how to sharpen, and you're good to go. You don't have to go around messing with these. If you want to pick that up as a hobby afterwards, that's fine. But learn how to use a plane first, and now you're able to evaluate how you're doing or how much work needs to be done on that old plane. So bottom line, I think save your time, buy a good plane, and be ready to go right from the, right from the time it arrives. Something else to consider, and that is a feature we call a bedrock. Now, before I show you how to identify it, I'm going to show you what, what it's all about. The opportunity to close the throat, that's the area where the shaving comes out, to close that down very tight helps you control tear out on boards that the grain's not nice and straight. If you try to do that on a traditional plane, here's what you have to do. Remove what's called the lever or the lever cap. Take the blade and chip breaker out. You'll find two screws right here. You come in and you loosen these two screws. And on most planes, there'll be a single screw back here. And as you turn that, it moves the frog forward. Now, on some of the older good ones, that's actually 
quite nice and tight, meaning it doesn't wobble side to side. On some of the newer ones, you could almost spin it around. Either way, you've got to line it up so that when you put the, it, tighten it back up again and put the blade in place, the blade will be projecting parallel to the sole. But it's a lot of guesswork because after you've moved it forward, you come in and you lock these screws again Put the blade and chip breaker back in, put your lever cap on, project your blade parallel to the sole, and then at that point, look at the gap. Well, it's way too wide, so now you've got to redo that again, and you may have to do it four or five times to finally get it right. On the bedrock style plane, it's done in a very different manner. Without removing anything, Back here, you'll find two what are called frog retaining screws. So whereas most planes are only going to have one screw, the bedrocks have three. You loosen the two outside frog retaining screws. Then the center screw will move the entire apparatus, meaning lever cap, blade chip breaker, and the frog. It'll move it forward. You simply watch the gap, turn it until you get the gap that you want, tighten up the two frog retaining screws, and now go to work. And if when you want to reverse it, you just loosen them and retract it. It's a very easy process. Now, that's a big deal if you're going to use your hand plane a lot. But not only that, the bedrocks were made better, which means they had a far more solid surface. What I mean is, the number one thing you need to control with your hand plane is blade vibration, or known as chatter. If it chatters, you get into hard woods, and it's going to vibrate and doesn't leave a very nice surface. So I'm going to show you the difference between how well supported the frog, which is what the blade actually sits on, how well supported it is on these older style planes, or we'll just call them non-bedrocks, and we'll compare it to the bedrock style plane. And what you have is a little pad here, a little pad there, a pad there, and a pad there, and it corresponds with the pads on this. That's what you have for a mating surface. And knowing that the, uh, how imperfect the grinding is, there's a pretty good chance that only three of those four surfaces are actually going to touch. Now, when we take this one out, look at the difference in the amount of surface there is, milled surface, for the frog to sit on the base or on the sole of the plane. Real solid contact. And the You'll way. also notice that the frog fits in there in a milled surface on the sides as well, so there's very little, if any, side-to-side -side slop. Moves forward and back and stays true to the sole. That's the reason why you want to find a bedrock. Now, if you're looking for an old one, the old ones typically, although not in the beginning, but for the most part, they were flat across the top of the shoulder, whereas the normal bench plane has that rounded shoulder. So trying to spot an old one in the wild, that's how you'll find it most easily. However, the newer companies that are making the same plane have followed the same th situation and they've flattened off the top. But better machining, um, far better support of the frog, and the flexibility of being able to open and close that with ease makes the bedrock the plane of choice. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our monthly newsletter has subscriber-only content, discounts monthly on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. All right, we're hitting all the hot topics. Remember, this is my opinion. You're going to hear that the low angle plane, low angle jack, should be your first plane. I disagree, and I'm going to show you why. First of all, let's talk about what reasons they have for telling you that. They say low angle is better for tear out. Well, I disagree, but again, let's prove it. What it really is addressing is the angle of attack or the angle with which the blade meets the wood. So the bedding angle on a low angle is 12 degrees. The primary bevel on the blade is 25, so add the two together and you've got 37. Almost everybody, for the simple convenience of the speed it takes with which you can do it, adds what we call secondary bevels or micro bevels. Typically, you're going to add probably somewhere around 5 degrees. So if you add 5 degrees to 37, you're now planing the wood at 42 degrees. A t standard bench plane where the bevel is on the bottom side, so if we take that off and look, there's the bevel. Now you're planing 
with a frog at 45 degrees, you're planing at 45 degrees. Two degree, three degrees difference? No, my book doesn't make a difference. And if I were to show you on the plane, you'd see for yourself. So I don't really think there's any difference with the planing angle. Some say, well, you can add, you can get a different blade or put a different bevel on there and change the angle of attack. Well, you can do the same thing on the on the uh, bench plane as well. In fact, in my tool tray, I keep a high angle blade. That's what the HA stands for. And what I've done, if you look closely, is I have polished a 20 degree back bevel on that blade. So when that's sitting in the plane at 45 degrees on the face of the frog, to 45, you add 20, you're planing at 65 degrees, which is a hard push, but it does an exceptional job on highly figured wood. So really no difference there. They say it's better for end grain. Again, they're referring to the low angle approach, but as I showed you, it's only three degrees difference, doesn't make a difference. Now, why do I say that this is not the plane to use? For two reasons, primarily. One is the weight. Let's put the blade back in to be fair. I'm actually gonna give you a third. Not nearly as heavy. You'll find when you start using a plane that the heavier it is, the easier it is to carry through the cut. So the five and a half is gonna be considerably heavier than the, than the low angle jack. The next reason, which is a big reason, and I'm going to include this in the uh, reason that I like to use five and a half as my go-to plane. This is a shooting board. The purpose of a shooting board is so that you can square the end of your board by simply setting the plane on its side, putting it up against a fence that has already been attached so that it is square to the side of this shooting board. And now when you plane the end of that wood, without having to check it, it's going to be perfectly square. Well, in order to do that, you want two things. You want weight, again, this is heavier than the low angle jack, and you want length. The more length you have between the toe and the blade, the more of a run you get to take before the blade engages the wood. You can't start back here, you'll end up running into the side of your plane. And there's actually one more factor to put in, and that is the amount of room you have on the side. If you were to compare the two, there's more surface area here than there is on here, which is gonna make this more stable on its side. And there's not a whole lot of room to grip this. Now you can buy attachments that make it a little bit easier, but with this one, without any attachment, at least you can drive this part of your palm in that wedge-shaped area, and it makes it fairly easy to use. I always keep my hand right over the widest part so that that plane stays standing plumb on its side. Last point to cover, and I'm comparing what I used to say to what I say now. I used to recommend the four and a half. Why did I switch? Well, on the shooting board, there is no comparison. You can see how much more room you have between the toe and where the blade is compared to this much shorter four and a half. The very fact that the plane is lighter makes it not nearly as effective on the shooting board. But I also like the fact that you've got more registration area up here on the front. So when you're starting to plane your board, this is what registers on the on the plane before, pardon me, on the board before the blade engages. So the more surface area you're going to have here, the more stable it's going to be when the blade digs into the wood. <clears throat> for those reasons and for the weight, I prefer much prefer the five and a half over the four and a half. For them. Whatever you do, you got to learn to sharpen. And I'm going to leave a link below to a video I did called 32 Seconds to Sharp, and it literally doesn't take any longer than that. But none of these tools will work if they're not sharp. Learn that skill first, and then you can make just about any plane work. The idea is which one's going to work even better for the time and money that you invest in it. Either way, wood is good. Enjoy it. See you soon. If you like my work and enjoy my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos and help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the link below, the chisel and plane icon, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our online and in-person workshops.